technology and humanity, what the digital world is doing to our soul. Well, where best to begin a talk on technology uh, but over 250 years ago? One fine spring morning in 17. 17- 46. This gentleman on the screen, Jean-Antoine Nollet, uh, gathered, uh, he, was a Fren- he was a French clergyman, and he gathered 200 monks uh, together in a field, and he lined them up in a line a mile long, and he connected each monk to his neighbor by a length of copper wire. Nollet then connected the end of the line to a primitive battery, instantly causing each monk to shriek and leap into the air. Uh, Nole was not some uh, monastic uh, masochist, rather he was conducting, pardon the pun, he was conducting an experiment to see how far electricity could be transmitted. Um, He was one of a group of uh, early scientists and researchers who thought that electricity was the key to building a long-distance communications uh, network. And the work of Nole and others led to the invention of the electric telegraph, uh, an, in, uh, a, an invention that changed the world. Because until the telegraph was invented, information could only travel at the speed of a man or a horse or a ship. Uh, the telegraph, on the other hand, allowed uh, information to be transmitted at uh, a massive speed. Indeed, it revolutionized the modern world. Indeed, it made the modern world. And that story is just a sort of a little reminder that changes in technology, especially changes in communication technology, change culture. When you invent new communication technologies, you change culture. And just as the telegraph, uh, the printing press, radio, uh, television, and TV have done before, have done before, so the internet and digital technology have changed our world. And they've changed our world and continue to change our world at lightning speed. We are now ever more connected as human beings than ever. The average person, the average person spends a third of their waking time now on their phone or their digital device, of which three hours is social networking. So for those of you in the room who checked your social media even while you were lying in bed this morning, you are in good company. Yet despite all of that connectivity, some interesting things are going on. Uh, A recent study revealed that 25% of university students, arguably one of the most connected groups when it comes to technology, 25% of university students report they feel lonely all the time. And 60% report they uh, they feel lonely uh, at least once a week. And in the wider uh, populations of our countries like Australia and the UK, the Western uh, world, westernized countries have been reported as experiencing an epidemic of loneliness with 20% of adults saying they struggle with the issue of loneliness. What on earth is going on? How can we be, on the one hand, be ever more connected, uh, faster uh, than we ever have before, yet people are wrestling more and more and more with the issue of loneliness? Could it perhaps be, even, that digital technology and loneliness are, in some ways, connected? Could the many hours that many of us spend online be related to the struggle that many of us have uh, with loneliness? Well, certainly many scientists think so. Uh, one of the world's most influential psychologists is a man called Jonathan Haidt, uh, a best-selling American author, uh, very, very, very brilliant psychologist, and has done a lot of work uh, in this area. And his research and the, has shown over the years there to be a strong link between technology and loneliness, especially in Generation Z. That's people born between uh, the years 1997 and 2012. In a recent article uh, he wrote on this issue, Jonathan shared with permission uh, an email he had received uh, from a university student. Listen to what this student says. Canadian university student wrote and said, My generation is incredibly isolated. We have shallow friendships and superfluous romantic relationships that are mediated and governed to a large degree by social media. There is hardly a sense of community on campus, and it's not hard to see why. Often I'll arrive early to a lecture to find a room of 30 or more students uh, sitting uh, in complete silence, absorbed in their smartphones, unable, to, afraid to, to speak, 
and be heard by their peers. This leads to further isolation and to a weakening of self-identity and confidence. Something I know because I have experienced it. You know, I wonder whether one of the reasons that technology is causing problems or some problems in our society is that technology offers us the fantasy that we need never be alone. We kid ourselves that we need never be alone because there's always the phone in our pocket, the tablet on our laps, the computer on our desk. But endless connection, I think, now means we have many people in our society uh, are terrified of being alone. And maybe this applies to us too as, as Christians. You know, maybe many of us too have found that when we are alone, we become fidgety, we become anxious, we become distressed. Just look at what we do when we're waiting in the lineup at the coffee shop or at the bus stop. Uh, what do we do? We grab our phones out and we start scrolling through. We can't deal with being alone, so we try and solve the problem of loneliness uh, with our phones. As the technology uh, writer and journalist William Powers puts it, he says, we have been effectively living uh, in the West by a philosophy, albeit an unconscious one. The philosophy holds that, number one, connecting via screens is good, and number two, the more you connect, the better. I call it digital maximalism, because the goal is maximum screen time. Few of us have decided that this is a wise approach to life, but let's face it, this is how we have been living. Or to give you one more voice diagnosing the problem, Sherry Turkle, uh, Jewish uh, background, social psychologist based at MIT uh, in, the, uh, in the States, and in a recent in a TED talk uh, that she gave, she argues that our basic problem is that we're lonely, but we're afraid of intimacy. And so we design technologies like social media to give the illusion of companionship, the illusion of friendship without the real thing, uh, because it gives us the idea that we can have all this stuff without the demands, but the result is a deepening loneliness. And in her more recent book, uh, Reclaiming Conversation, The Power of Talk in a Digital Age, Sherry observes, she says, we say we turn to our phones when we're bored, and we often find ourselves bored because we have become accustomed to a constant feed of connection and information and entertainment. There is now a word in the dictionary called fubbing. Fubbing means maintaining eye contact whilst texting. My students tell me they do it all the time, and it's not that hard. All this adds up to a flight from conversation, at least from conversation that is open-ended and spontaneous conversation in which we play with ideas, in which we allow ourselves to become fully present and vulnerable. But whether or not technology is a help or a hindrance when it comes to connection uh, and to loneliness, there's a bigger question lurking behind all of this. And it's a question that we played with uh, last night for those of, you who, who, those of you who are here. I introduced you to the wandering question. And in all that's going on with technology and all the conversations around it in our society, I wonder whether there is a massive wandering question uh, lurking in the room like a badly camouflaged elephant. And the question is this, have you ever wondered why it is that we long for connection in the first place? Why is it that human beings long for connection in the first place? Why do we need to feel needed? Why do we want to be included? Why do we yearn for a relationship? Does our desire for connection reveal something uh, more deeply about us as human beings? Certainly the fact that we, are, we need connection would rule out the ridiculous idea you hear in some secular corners of the world uh, that we are just meat-based computers. The um, famous uh, computer scientist Marvin Lee Minsky once remarked, the brain just happens to be a meat machine. Thanks, uh, Marvin. That was helpful and encouraging. There's a reason he's a computer scientist and not a motivational speaker. Um, furthermore, despite, uh, despite all the ridiculous talk around artificial intelligence, uh, right now. There's been much talk in recent months of uh, technologies like ChatGPT. I tried out ChatGPT uh, the other week and I managed to convince it with, with, that uh, within a couple of minutes I managed to convince it that uh, ducks could be larger than camels and I managed to convince it that hamsters could play the guitar. Um, clearly things like this reveal that we are just more than machines. We are not just very clever artificial intelligence uh, entities just running on biological software. Uh, not, uh, not, uh, not silicon. 
But couldn't an atheist just say, well, the reason we are wired for connection arises from the fact we are, we are social primates. We have evolved to operate in community. Well, we're certainly not less than that, but I think also we're obviously more than that. So that's why we can feel alone in the crowd of people and why we don't just want to fight, reproduce, or pick fleas off each other. But maybe our deep desire for connection, I often say to my secular friends, I just wonder, could it be a clue to the way we've been designed, a signpost, a clue to something bigger going on about us. William Powers, that journalist I quoted to you a few minutes ago, um, he makes a wonderful little point in his, uh, his, in his book, Hamlet's Blackberry, Building a Good Life in the Digital Age. Brilliantly titled book and a very, very funny little book about some of the pressures and challenges of digital technology. Um, but in that book, William makes the suggestion that one reason why we have got a little bit nervous in society about asking questions about how deeply connected we are and how addicted to our machines we are is that once you start asking those questions, very quickly other questions come tumbling after them. Uh, William says, you know, when you start wondering about your own busyness, pretty soon you're pondering much deeper questions such as, is this the kind of life I really want? From there, it is just a short hop to the big league, existential stumpers. Why are we here and whom am I? In other words, and I've had this conversation with many friends over the years, you know, once you start wondering if you're too busy, if you're too glued to your phone, if you realize you're a bit lonely, longing for connection, this raises the huge question of purpose. What is it we are here for as human beings? And the purpose question is the one that our society really is quite afraid of asking, actually, in many ways. But purpose is a crucial question. You know, the, by its purpose that enables us to answer much bigger questions, such as questions about right and wrong, good and evil, good and bad. For example, its purpose that enables you to tell whether something is good or bad. For example, if, I, if you come up to me at the lunch break and uh, you uh, have a conversation with, with me, and in that, during that conversation, I happen to mention that although I may not look it, I'm actually in a really bad mood today. And you say, well, Andy, why are you in a, why are you in a bad mood? You look like a sort of happy-go-lucky British guy. And I say, well, I'm in a bad mood because just before heading out to Australia a few weeks ago, I, bu I bought a, a new watch at the jewellery store. And the watch, the, 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 the jewellery store, they sold me a bad watch. They ripped me off. And you go, well, Andy, what do you mean a bad watch? And I say, well, you know, you'll never believe this. I was using my new watch to hammer in nails. I was putting up shelves, I hadn't got a hammer, so I used the watch to hammer in nails, and, I, and the watch broke. The jewelry store ripped me off. I suspect you might say a couple of things. The first thing you might say is, would you like the number of a good therapist here in, uh, here in Victoria? Uh, or more compassionately, maybe you might say, look, um, you need to understand that something about watches, Andy. The, the purpose of a watch is to tell the time, and we determine whether a watch is a good watch or a bad watch by how successfully it does that, not by how much you can use it to put shelves up. And you'd be absolutely right. Knowing the purpose of a watch means we can determine whether it's a good one or a bad one, and so on. Well, if that's true of something as simple as a wristwatch, what then of human beings? What is the purpose of a human life? What does a good life look like? A life lived in a way that will see us thrive. And how do we begin to answer that question without, of course, first answering the much bigger question of what we're here for. And I'll often say to my friends, I wonder if we can begin to think about that purpose question, because if we can do that, maybe it will help us with the problem we began with, the problem of loneliness. You see, surprisingly, loneliness is a very, very modern phenomena. It's a very modern phenomena. In the recent book, A Biography of Loneliness, the History of an Emotion. That was written by a, uh, a historian called Faye Bound Alberti. As far as I know, Faye is, has no re religious faith at all. She certainly doesn't identify as, uh, as anything, so not a Christian as far as I'm aware. And in that book, in that study of the idea of loneliness, she shows that the word loneliness, the idea of loneliness, in its modern negative sense, did not emerge until about 1800. 
Now, that doesn't mean that before 1800, people weren't alone. Sure, people spent time on their own before 1800. But when you look at literature from that period, being alone was not perceived negatively. People did not use the word loneliness, they used the word solitude. And solitude was usually a positive thing. It was usually a good thing. It was seen as a, as a thing you wanted to aim for, not avoid. So what changed? How do we go in a couple of hundred years from solitude being good to loneliness being terrible? Well, staggeringly, for someone who apparently has no faith in her book, she argues that one reason, there are several, but one major reason is the loss of belief in God. If you believe in, in God, uh, that means even when nobody else is around, you are not alone. You are never alone, even though you may be the only human being uh, for a square mile or two. But of course, to raise the question our secular friends might raise, does that therefore mean that God is, couldn't God just be a psychological crutch? Couldn't God just be a comforting invention for those of us who can't get through life unaided? Well, of course, the problem with that response is you can explain anything away using psychology, including, incidentally, atheism. Because if there is a God, then it's atheism that's the psychological crutch that's been invented by people so they can live their lives with no accountability. Uh, one of my friends is the, uh, the well-known Christian writer and Oxford professor John Lennox. Some of you may have heard of John, very well-known Christian writer. He's debated many of the famous atheists, and he tells the story that on one occasion, uh, some atheist, uh, I, I don't think it was Dawkins, it was one of the others, made a quip to him. They went, oh, come on, John, admit it. You know, Christianity is just a, just a belief system for people who are afraid of the dark. And John just looked at him and went, maybe atheism is an invention of people who are too afraid of the light. <laughs> You can explain anything away with psychology. What matters is what's true and what's real. And I would su suggest that our desperate, our deep need for connection, uh, the existence of God, explains both that and it explains why we're passionate about things like truth, incidentally, as well. But when it comes to God, it's crucial we're clear which God we're talking about. It's crucial we're clear which God we're talking about. There are lots of conceptions of God kicking around the place, and many of those are wildly different. And of course, as Christians, we want to be talking about the God of the Bible, a God about whom the Bible says some very profound things when it comes to the question of connection and loneliness. For example, the Bible begins by telling us that God has designed us for relationship. He's designed us for deep connection, both with each other and also with him. That is why our hearts are ultimately restless. It's why we struggle with loneliness, or it's why we risk damaging our relationships when we expect our friends or our loved ones to validate our entire identities. In fact, as the ancient African Christian Augustine put it some 1,600 years ago, he wrote, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in God. Well, secondly, as well as telling us that God designed us for relationship and connection, the Bible tells us that God did not create us to be robots or slaves or slightly smarter than average primates, but God created us to be sons and daughters. That's the amazing invitation of the gospel that the Bible says that God made to us. Thirdly, the Bible is very honest about the problem at the heart of all of this. We're separated from God due to our rebellion and our self-centeredness. We've turned our backs on God. We've made ourselves the center of the story, and we've often used other people as means rather than as ends. And the result is the brokenness and the alienation and that epidemic of loneliness we see all over Western society. But then, of course, as I hope we all know in this room, the amazing news of the Bible is that although we've turned our backs on God, he has not turned his back on us, but stepped into history in the person of Jesus so that we might know him. God is no mere abstract idea, is he, in Christianity. The Bible says, if you want to know what God is truly like, then you take a look at Jesus. And here's a final thought on this whole subject for as well, almost a final thought as we draw some threads together. What's fascinating, when you look at the Gospels and you look at Jesus, you notice something very interesting about Jesus and relationships. Jesus was a person who was deeply connected to God and deeply connected to others. And although Jesus was often alone, he would often go to places on his own and pray, only once do we read of him being actually lonely. 
Only once does the, did the gospel say he was lonely. And of course, that was when he was crucified and abandoned by his friends, abandoned by his followers, and abandoned by God when Jesus cries out from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And what's astonishing about that is you have this incredibly powerful window here into the wonder of the gospel. Because at the heart of the Christian faith lies this amazing and incredible and wonderful claim that Jesus took our rebellion and our sinfulness onto his shoulders and he gave up his connection with God that we might know connection with God. And that's what's on offer for those who place their trust in Jesus. As again, I hope we all know this morning, is what's on offer is forgiveness and reconciliation and welcome into God's family, adoption as God's beloved son or God's beloved daughter. And the wonder of when you take that seriously, that brings with it the joy of knowing that even when you may be in total solitude, you need never be alone because God's presence goes with you. Do you know, we live in an information-saturated age. We are drowning in data, and yet we are lonelier than ever. So therefore, I am so grateful that God did not send an idea. God did not send a piece of data. He did not send an app. But in Jesus, God sends himself. Whenever changes in communications technology come, as I said at the start of this talk, they change culture profoundly. But what excites me is when you look back through history, Christians, the church, have good track record on some of this. Christians have always embraced new technology, and especially we've always embraced communications technology. It was Christians who were early adopters of the Codex. Uh, that's the book form for printing information. Just around the time of the, when the Gospels were being written, uh, scrolls were still the most common way that people would read, but some Roman artisan somewhere, we know not exactly who, had the idea of cutting parchment into pieces, stitching them together, and he came up with a book. And the early Christians latched onto this as a thoroughly brilliant way to dis disseminate the Gospels. And one of the reasons that the book spread so widely and so fast as a form of technology was because the church were using it for distributing the, the, uh, the, the New Testament. Some 1,500 years later, we have Gutenberg's, uh, we have the printing press. Think of Gutenberg's uh, Bible, those two things very closely connected. Uh, likewise, it was Christians who very rapidly, we adopted technology, radio, TV, uh, and in time, the internet. Every new technology brings challenges, and I've talked about some of those this morning, but every new technology also brings incredible opportunities. And I think Christians, we have been at our absolute best in history when we have not just used technology, but we've also helped people think about technology. So the internet has changed culture faster than any invention to date. And that means we have to think hard. We have to think biblically. We have to think theologically. We have to think missionally, not just so that we can use technology well to communicate the news of, uh, of the gospel, but also so we can ask good questions and we can answer the questions that people are asking. And right now, there are so many questions being asked in culture about technology and what it's doing to us. And I think it's vital that as Christians, we get into that conversation because there are ter terrific opportunities to share Christ through it. Because there are no simple answers, ultimately, when it comes to digital technology and to the big questions it raises about personhood and identity and busyness and so on. But those are great ways and great themes to start conversations. One conversation started right now, I think, with people who are immersed in technology concerns what the good life looks like. If we are living in a digital culture, a digital cage even, that doesn't support the things that we value as humans and as society, then, then I think it's vital for all of us, but especially it's vital for Christians whom God has called to be about kingdom values that we begin to join in this conversation about how culture and technology can perhaps be rebuilt and reshaped. And in a world of busyness where so many of our friends are drowning under information, I talk to so many people who when you ask them how they're doing, their answer is, I'm busy because of all the emails and notifications and tweets and all the other stuff out there. In that world of crazy busyness, what an opportunity to introduce our friends to the words of Jesus. Come to me. 
all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest.'"